Good morning and God's peace. Let's begin our Christmas service by singing 26, When Christmas Morn is Dawning. I want to wish everyone a joyous and Merry Christmas and pray that we all have a blessed Christmas day. So welcome everyone to our services, Christmas service this morning. And a special welcome to our visitors and online guests. Our schedule this week is Wednesday no service. Thursday our Christmas services will begin with Pastor Nathan Jutenen at 7 p.m. There will be a coffee following. And Friday evening there's a service at 7 p.m. with a coffee following. Saturday, there'll be a men's breakfast at 8 a.m. and a youth gathering at 7 p.m. Next Sunday, there's no Sunday school. There'll be a worship service with Pastor Nathan Jutenen at 10.30 a.m. and an afternoon service at 1.30 p.m. And after the sermon today, we'll sing the doxology and then we'll sing two additional songs. Now we'll continue with singing three songs before the prayer. And the first song is number 40 out of Peace on Earth book, I heard the bells on Christmas Day.
would first of all wish you a merry and blessed Christmas. We turn this morning to Psalm 96, reading in Jesus' name. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heaven. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice. Before the Lord cometh, before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, let us give thanks and pray. Dear gracious and loving God, we do indeed come to you this morning with joy in our hearts and rejoicing on our lips for that unspeakable gift which has been given unto us, the gift of salvation, even the gift that the angels heralded for unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You shall name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And dear Father, as we do indeed celebrate this day with thankfulness, we do it while looking at Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Even, even as we have the joy of Christmas downing in our hearts even today, we do in, indeed remember the great gift that was given and the price that was paid that we might gather here together as your preciously redeemed children. Redeemed not with silver nor with gold, but with the holy blood of Jesus Christ. For this cause, came I to this world, as Jesus said. But as we gather here today, as we gather here today to hear that wonderful account of Jesus' birth, we ask that you would be with Pastor Paul as he rises to again give us this message, not a same old message, but a new message each and every day in our hearts as we receive it by grace through faith. Dear Father, we ask that you would press this message into our hearts this morning. That first of all, we would know, we would have sure and steadfast hope and knowledge that Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And then in doing so, we would be able to be strengthened in our journey, in our walk, among our brothers and sisters in faith here, ever doing that which is right and needful and best for our brother. Proclaiming that message of salvation in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we gather here today, we ask that you would be with those who are not able to gather. We ask for the shut-ins for the elderly among us, those who would be on beds of sickness, those who are in recovery from ailments that assail us each and every day, 
We pray that you would be with the lonely, with those who are separated by miles from their family, from their loved ones. We ask that you would bring us all closer together in that perfect bond of love which is found in Jesus Christ, who is the epitome of your love. And as we commit this service unto thy care and thy keeping, we ask that you would hear us as we pray, as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We turn now to the Old Testament reading for Christmas Day. It's found in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah, chapter 9, reading in Jesus' name. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. As in the day of Isaiah, when the nations were afflicted by the enemy, and not knowing what would become of them, we also live in a similar situation. Each of us are assailed every day. The enemy of the soul is relentless against us. And that is why Christmas Day is such a joyous occasion, that the grace of God has appeared unto all men. The grace of God which is manifest in Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the midst of your turmoil, whatever it may be, even as Isaiah wrote there in verse 5, maybe at times this is how our hearts feel. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be burning with burning and fuel of fire. And then listen, dear one, for unto us, unto you, each and every one of you, individually, all of us gathered here, for unto us a son is, a child is born, unto us a son is given. The greatest gift that ever was given, may it be yours today, by faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll now continue with number 70 in the Peace on Earth book, The Birthday of a King, number 70.
as we've already, from our Chairman Andy and Pastor Phil, have you been wished to marry in a blessed Christmas? I also wish to, to wish that upon you also, that God would grant you a blessed and a Merry Christmas. I want to read the greeting as Pastor Phil read yesterday before we turn to our text from the angel Gabriel as he spoke to Mary this greeting is also for all of us this morning as he began with hail or rejoice thou art highly favored the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among all people I changed the last just a little bit but rejoice this morning my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, because you are highly favored. God has poured out his grace. God is showing his grace to you again today. Just the fact that you are sitting here is proof positive that God is gracious to you because you have been here and you have heard the message of salvation already sung. You have heard the word of God read from our pastor Phil as he expounded a little bit there so preciously what God has done for you. You are truly blessed. So rejoice this morning. Thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among all people. We are going to turn to the second chapter of Luke as we look into the incarnation of God, our Lord and our Redeemer. As we look at these words, as we see God becoming man, I am reminded of the reason why he came here. And as we have already heard, but if we were to turn to the book of Hebrews before we turn to our text, the second chapter, reading from verse 14. Once I get there, that is. This is why Jesus came into the world. Reading from verse 14 in the name of our Lord. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had, that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore... In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he also is, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That's why our Lord came. That's why we celebrate today his incarnation because we are flesh and blood, and we have all fallen into sin. So he partook of the same, to be tempted in all points like as us, so that he could help you and me. He knows who we are, so let us rejoice. So turning to Luke chapter two, beginning with verse one, reading through verse 20, in the name of our Lord and our Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, 
For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Amen. Are there any more beautiful words ever recorded than God's love for you and for me? As we have just read this morning. God sent his only begotten son into the world. For God so loved you and me that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our text begins with these words, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And it came to pass in those days. And I don't know how far in advance this, this decree had gone out, this message that every person needed to go back to, their, to the, the home of their forefathers, as in Joseph and Mary's case, back to the home of David. I have no clue. The Bible doesn't tell us how, how much notice they had. But I do know what was written just before this. Three months before this child was born, before our Lord and our Redeemer was born, but just maybe just a couple months before this, they had it, headed to Jerusalem. We don't know. We see Zechariah. And I know I spoke on this last Sunday, but this is so beautiful. The thing's just praising God for his rich salvation. As God had opened his tongue, or loosed his tongue, I should say, and filled him with the Holy Spirit after he had written his name as John. And these words came forth, and they are for you and me again this morning, as he praised and glorified God, the Lord God, of Israel, for he had visited and redeemed his people as he prophesied of this truth that was going to happen as if it had already happened because it had. As he glorified God and said this, that God himself had raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of him that hate us. As Zacharias glorified and praised God for the fact that God had raised up one who had the courage and the strength, one who had enough love, Jesus Christ himself, he had raised him up from the lineage of David to come and redeem you and me. After those days, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And I just find this so amazing. My dear brothers and sisters, this is proof positive that God still reigns and rules in the affairs of men. This man, Caesar, I don't, I'm not as much of a history buff as some of you, but Caesar Augustus, he was a grandnephew of Julius Caesar. He was his rightful adopted heir to the throne of Rome. After he had vanquished all of his enemies and he set supreme as ruler over the known world at that time from Britain all the way down across southern Europe around the east end of the Mediterranean Sea 
clear out to Iran, where modern-day Iraq and Iran is today, and down across northern Africa. After he was sitting supreme upon his throne, he gave himself this title, Augustus, claiming that he was God, or a demigod, demigod. And God, the Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth, uses him, this man, to make sure that Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem at the appointed time so that Christ could be born according to the prophecy of Micah the prophet, as he prophesied so long before that unto you Bethlehem Euphrata, although they were middle, little among the people, that unto, out of Bethlehem would come a savior. God, my dear brothers and sisters, sits supreme on the throne in heaven. We don't need to worry how great men may appear to be and how troubling the things may look, as Pastor Phil has already mentioned. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government is upon his shoulders, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, and as we go on. John writes in the first chapter of Revelations of him that he is the prince of the kings of the earth. This babe reigns supreme. Let us give him all honor and glory. So this Caesar Augustus made a decree, and according to this decree, that all men should go to, to their, the city of their forefathers to be registered or to be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. The word is told us time and time again. We heard it yesterday as Pastor Phil spoke from the seventh chapter, as he went back to the seventh chapter of the sec second book of Samuel how God himself was going to raise up one of the seed of David who would sit on his throne forever. And as Pastor Phil read from the, the ninth chapter of Isaiah that he is from, would sit on the throne of his father David. So here we have Mary and Joyce, Joseph who are of the lineage of David to fulfill this promise, this pro promise given so long ago. They come to Bethlehem, the house, the home place of David. If you look in the 1 Samuel, the 16th and the 17th chapters, you see that David was born and raised in Bethlehem. And I think, I find this interesting as I, would, been, as I you read through the Old Testament that David in 2 Samuel as he was, as he longed when he was at battle with the Philistines, how he longed for the waters out of the well that were at the gates of Bethlehem. And I was thinking about this, and maybe this is just my own imagination going too far, but that well there must have been a pretty special well, and the water in it was obviously very wonderful tasting water, and how David longed for that water. And here now, the very one who gives to you and me the very water of life. He is going, coming, being brought to Bethlehem in the womb of his mother to be born there. The one who told the woman at the well that Samaria, if you drink of the water that I will give, you will never thirst again and out of your belly will come fountains of living water. The message of salvation will flow from you. That one is coming to Bethlehem to be born as Mary and Joseph come there. And the text tells us, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I don't know, and the text doesn't tell us how long in advance Mary and Joseph were in 
Bethlehem. It appears like they had been there for some days because the text says while they were there, the days were accomplished. But there was obviously no room in the end, as our text tells us. And so they were in the stable. And that's where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that's where God himself, the one who spoke the world into existence, that's where the Messiah was born, in a stable. Isn't that wonderful? That God would humble himself to such a low estate for first to take upon ourselves his form, but to be born there in a stable, to be laid in a manger for you and for me, so that all men, so all of us can feel free to come to him. He's not so high and lofty that we cannot or should not feel that we can come to him. No, he was born meek and lowly so that all men would feel free to come and gather there at this manger to behold him. And I pray that this Christmas day that every one of you would behold your Lord and your Redeemer. And there was in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Sore afraid. Shepherds abiding, watching over their flocks by night. There have been many different things said about the shepherds, how they were kind of the lowest of people. I don't believe that. What I see here is they're just an average, normal, everyday person, going, people going about their life, doing what they have been called in to do, called to do, serving in the occupation that God has called them in, and the messenger of the Lord appears to them. Think about this when you think about shepherds. When you look through the scriptures, who are the shepherds that come to your mind? They were not despised people. The first one that comes to my mind is a man called Abel. He believed God. He was a servant of God. The next one would be a man named Moses. He was a shepherd. David himself. And who was the greatest shepherd of all? Our Lord and our Redeemer. The 10th chapter of Hebrews, I mean 10th chapter of John, Jesus tells us that I am the good shepherd. And why did he come? So that we could have life and have it more abundantly. He came down, this shepherd came to lay down his life for you and for me. And this is what Christmas is all about. He said, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. And David himself writes of him. Are the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But there were these shepherds going about their, their occupation. They were faithful men. I see this so clearly too. They were alert, they were awake, they were doing their job. And lo, the text tells us that the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. It means exactly what it says. They were greatly afraid or they were terrified. And without a shadow of a doubt, I know for a fact that if an angel appeared to you and me and the glory of the Lord was radiating from him as it was with these shepherds, every single one of us would also be terrified. Look what happened to those guards, those trained Roman soldiers as they were guarding the tomb. And that angel came down from heaven and the glory of the Lord radiated from him that they fell as it were de as dead men on the ground. Because when the glory of the Lord, when, we re when the glory of God is revealed to every single one of us, we have no other option but to be afraid because we see our sin. Because when the glory of the Lord radiates from the heavenly Father, and it, into each and every one of us, we stand before him undone. 
we stand before him as the chief of sinners, knowing that in me, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. But these angels, these, this angel has a powerful message. And that message was for those shepherds long ago, but it's also for you and me today. If the glory of the Lord has reached into your heart and you find yourself a sinner, you know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, to the message of the angel. He tells us, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Not just some people. This message is to go out for all people. God so loved the world, we heard again, that he gave his only begotten son. That's the entire world. The word tells us that it is the will of God that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. That's the heart and the message that comes from God. That I love you. I died for you. Quit looking at yourself, repent, turn, and look, and behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And this is the message of the angel. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. In other words, the Messiah. The Christ is born. And we all know that Christ simply means, I shouldn't say simply, but what it means is the anointed one. There, born in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago, is your great high priest. There, born to over 2,000 years ago, is that perfect Passover lamb. There, born over 2,000 years ago in that main stable and laid in a manger, is our great high priest who's come to offer himself for your sins and for mine, as we read in the ninth chapter of Hebrews how he went once in the holiest of holies, and he did not go in there with the blood of bulls and goats, but he went with his own blood, and he offered it for you and me, and in so doing, he obtained eternal salvation for us. There, born in the manger, as we've already said, was the spotless lamb of God, the one who came and took upon himself our flesh, became a man, and lived without sin, that's why he came here. Born without, conceived without sin. Lived without sin. And then became sin for us because he took upon himself all of your sins and all of mine. There, my dear brothers and sisters, in that stable, as the manger says, is Christ the Lord, your Redeemer and mine. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. This angel says, go into Bethlehem. and says, there in a manger, you will find the Christ. He told them how to find him. And that is the message that resounds down through the ages. That Christ, the Lord God, has been born. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of a heavenly host praising God and saying, <clears throat> as I look at this, and this is just my speculation, but I see all of heaven emptying. There were a lot of angels over the plain of Bethlehem that night. Our Lord, as he was in the garden, as they came to arrest him, we remember that Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the, high, the servant of the high priest and Christ rebuked him there as he healed the, the ear of that man who Peter had cut off. He says, don't you know, Peter, that I could call, ask the Father and he would send 12 legions of angels if I so ask. And as far as I can tell, a legion of Roman soldiers is somewhere between five and 6,000. So what Christ is saying, you know, Peter, God, I could have asked and God could have sent over 72,000 angels. 
And that's what I see. I see over 72,000 angels. And I don't, the Bible doesn't tell us this, but that's what I see. As they came down from heaven, and they were glorifying God and saying, they were praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And my dear brothers and sisters, this Christmas morn, if the angels saw fit to come down from heaven, glorifying and praising God for your salvation, why do we sit so stoically? Why do we just take it for granted? How come it does not work within us wonder and praise and adoration for our God, for what he has done for us? Pastor Phil mentioned yesterday that who the angels are. They are ministering spirits. We read that in the 14th verse of the first chapter of Hebrews. And what are they sent here to do? They are to sent to minister unto those who would be the heirs of salvation. And what were these angels? And I want to spend a few moments this morning thinking about the message of the angels. What was the message that the angels brought in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and in the book of Acts? We remember the first message was from Gabriel to John, I mean to Zacharias that they would have a child, Elizabeth would have a child, and they'll call his name John. In other words, God is gracious. Why? Because John was going to go bringing the baptism of repentance. He was going to prepare the way, bring them into the knowledge of their sin, and point to, to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The angel can Gabriel come back a few months later with another message to a young lady which we heard yesterday a young virgin, and what was his message? Hail or rejoice because you are highly favored, because God has chosen to pour out his grace upon you, just as he's chosen to pour out it upon you, you all of the day. And she was going to have a son, and she was going to call him Jesus. In other words, Jehovah saves. That's the message of the angel. The next time the angel spoke that we hear recorded in the words, he came to Joseph and he told him, don't be afraid to take unto you Mary as your wife because that Holy One that is conceived in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit and you are to call his name Jesus because he has came. He's come into this world to save his people from their sins. The next time we hear the angels is in, us, in our text here. As they came with that great fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. And when is the next time that we see the angels or hear the angels speak? It's resurrection morn. When the women had come to the tomb, prepared to anoint the dead body of their Lord and their Redeemer. And what was the message of the angel? Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. Let me go and just read so I don't misquote the rest of that verse. Go to the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Sorry, it's this, this, if I believe, it's maybe, if I find the right place, it's Luke, maybe the 24th, the same Gospel. 24 chapter, yeah. And as they were afraid, this is the women, as they, these two angels stood before them and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. That's the message of the angel. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Don't you remember as he told you that he came to this world to die for you and on the third day rise again? And again, in the first chapter of Acts, these angels came and they spoke to the, pro the, the apostles as they stood gazing up into heaven. And they asked him, why? Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? Don't you know, as 
that Jesus will come back just as, the same way as he ascended. And isn't that the same message that Pastor Phil and myself and all who stand in the pulpit, all who bring the message, the same message that we have is this message that the angels has. Fear not. God is gracious. God sent his son into the world to redeem you. God came, sent his son to save you. He is not dead. He died, but he rose again. Now you have been begotten unto a lively hope of eternal life, to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled will not fade away, because God was satisfied with his sacrifice. God saw the travail of his soul, as, he, as Isaiah said, and he was satisfied. And he's going to come again and receive you to himself. This message is for those who would be the heirs of salvation. So rejoice this morning as we hear the message of the angels. As suddenly, I'm going to read it again, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace, goodwill towards men. What more can I say? And as it came to pass, the angel was gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. The angels can speak but one thing, and that's what God himself had given them to speak. As Pastor Phil and I were visiting here just a little bit before he went down, their message is the gospel of God. The good news sent straight from the heart of God himself. And that's why these shepherds says, let us go now unto Bethlehem and see this thing which God has made known unto us. Let us go and see our Redeemer. And they, were, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and a babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen as it was told unto them. My dear brothers and sisters, as we go home this afternoon or this morning, let us sing a new song unto the Lord, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm has gotten him to victory. Let us come to the manger. Let us look there this morning and know that that little baby laying there is your Lord and your Redeemer. Let us know what, let, let us see the one who came to take upon himself your debt and mine. Let us see his great love. Oh, that we could see how much he loved us. What does the Hebrew writer tell us? That for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and now is set down at the right hand of God. For the glory, for the joy of doing the will of the Father, and what was the will of the Father? That you and I could be saved. So let us give him all honor and glory this Christmas day in his holy and blessed name, amen. Let us pray. Dear Father, we your children along with the angels we praise your holy name. We can, words fail me, dear Father, but we, we thank you for that great gift, the gift of salvation. We thank you for that great gift, the gift of your only begotten Son. We thank you for the truths that your Son uttered that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. O oh, dear Father, we ask that you would steal the Christ child and the truths 
of why he came here into every one of our hearts, that we could walk through this world rejoicing with the angels, singing glory to God in the highest because of the peace that he has brought to us through his son, your son, Jesus the Christ. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.